on to our last chapter here. So today we are going to take a look at, uh, really to start with here, the ovary and kind of some of the stages of the different ovarian follicles will be what we'll be taking a look at here. We'll then kind of work our way through some of the rest of the reproductive tract of the female and then head over to the male. There'll be a couple shows on the male just for the very simple fact that there's a few more organs that are present in the males that we are going to need to take a look at. So to start with here, we're going to take a look at the female reproductive tract overall. Uh, you're looking at the uterus right here, the floping tubes. I was going to say it looks a little bit like a moose. So you got the moose's head right here and then its antlers and ears. Uh, these are the ovaries, the fallopian tubes, the uterine body, and then you have the vagina and then the external orifice there. When we're looking at the ovary, we're going to see that there's a few different stages in development of those ovarian follicles that we're going to be taking a look at. So we're going to be looking at what are called primary, secondary, and graphene follicles, as well as the corpus luteum. So when you're looking at an ovary, you're going to see that there's this cortex out here and then this medulla in the center here. And what you're going to see is these large circular structures here and here. Those are oocytes that are developing and they're developing with these in these follicles. And we're going to see that there's a few different stages of development of these follicles that you're going to need to be able to differentiate. So prior to birth, everything, all the egg cells that a female is ever going to have are developed as primordial follicles. And at about puberty, there's probably about 400,000 primary, uh, excuse me, primordial follicles left. Once the monthly cycle starts, what's going to happen is these will start to develop based on hormones from the pituitary gland. Again, not something we're going into in histology here, but they will develop into what are called primary follicles. They start out as a single layer of cuboidal cells here. These cells will start making estrogen and then they'll develop more and more and get these multi-layered primary follicles that are these cells surrounding it are called granulosa cells. Uh, we also have this little line here called the zona pellucida, and then you have the thacal cells that surround this. But you'll get this primary follicle with multiple layers of that stratified cuboidal. We then will get to a secondary follicle, which looks pretty much similar with the exception that we start getting this fluid-filled cavity called the antrum. And by the end here, we get to what is called a graphene or mature follicle, which is going to have this cell, this uh, oocyte, surrounded by these cells called the corona radiata, which are some of those leftover granulosa cells, on a little stalk called the cumulus oophorus, and then surrounded completely by this antrum, which is filled with this liquor folliculi. And that's the, what we're going to be looking at in here, and it's at this stage where it's going to be ready for ovulation and what's going to be left there will become something called the corpus luteum. So oocytes are kind of interesting in that when you're going through these primary divisions of this, it goes through meiosis. Again, the main thing is when you have a sperm cell and an egg cell coming together, they need to make 46 uh, total chromosomes, 23 pairs of chromosomes. If cell division happened the same way in sex cells as it did, does in somatic cells, you would end up, when those two sex cells came together, with them having 46 pairs of chromosomes, which would be too many. What is interesting with these egg cells and their development is you really, from a primary oocyte, you're only going to get one functional oocyte out of this. And it's because these cells need to be quite large to maintain the number of uh, organelles and cytoplasm necessary for that embryo or that zygote to undergo its initial divisions to get ready for implantation. Uh, so what we see is the rest of these become what are called polar bodies. So these primordial follicles develop during, like I said, as time as a fetus. They start going this first meiotic division and are paused in the middle of that. And prior to uh, Puberty, a number of these are going to go through a process called atresia where you lose a lot of these. You start with about one and a half million. It's down to about 400,000 by the time puberty starts in terms of egg cells that could develop. At puberty, you're going to start getting release of FSH and LH, which are going to cause these primordial follicles to develop into primary follicles. Uh, and it develops these cells called granulosa cells. 
And then you get these surrounding support cells called thacal cells, which these fibroblasts differentiate to that are surrounding this. Uh, that zona pellucida, which is this dark line, is a layer of glycoproteins between the oocyte and the granulosa that you'll be able to see. And you can kind of see this right here. You have these granulosa cells, these thacal cells surrounding it. You can see a primordial cell, a follicle right here. You can see how this one is a primary one because now we have a layer of simple cuboidal cells. And that would be that zona pellucida right here, that dark line that separates the granulosa cells from the oocyte. And you can see it even a little bit better on this one. So this overall structure here is a follicle. And one of the things is we look at the different sizes of these follicles, the egg cell is consistent. It should be about the same size. So as you look at the follicle getting larger and larger in that uh, egg cell, that oocyte being smaller and smaller, it's not that the oocyte is smaller. It's that we've now zoomed out quite a bit to get the whole follicle in view. So it should give you an idea of scale if this size of this egg cell is consistent that as these follicles get bigger and bigger, you can see that relative to the follicle, the egg cell will become smaller and smaller. So on this one, you can see a multi-layered primary follicle, no uh, antrum developing yet, and you get some of these thacal cells developing along the outside. The secondary or antral follicle is where you start getting that fluid-filled cavity called the antrum. It's filled with that, like I said, liquor, liqueur folliculi. Sounds like a weird uh, something you could get at the liquor store, but it's just that antrum fluid in there. So you're going to get these thacal cells developing a little bit more that help secrete substances that will become estrogen after the granulosa cells convert it. So again, now we can see the oocyte here. We see this antrum filled cavity granulosa cells, these thacal cell layer now surrounding that. This is releasing androgens which are getting converted to estrogen by these granulosa cells. Finally, by the time we get to the actual mature stage, this is the graphene follicle. You're gonna see you have these multiple layers of thacal cells, this huge antrum, and then you have this cumulative oophorus, which is this little stalk and this oocyte being surrounded by a layer of cells called the corona radiata. It's actually a surge of LH at this point that causes this to undergo its final part of meiosis one and leads to actual ovulation of this one, that spike of LH at about the midpoint of the, on average, 28 day cycle. So now you can see all this right here. You can see that thacal cell layer again surrounding it. Those granulosa cells, this very large antrum, and then you have that cumulative forest, that stalk that it's sitting on, and the crony radiata still surrounding that oocyte. And this is kind of showing you the development. Obviously, an ovary at any one snapshot is not going to look like this with one in each stage. In general, every month you're going to get between the two ovaries, usually one oocyte that is going to get to that, gra one follicle, excuse me, that is going to get to that graphene stage. Uh, most of the rest of them will start and then not finish that one and then degenerate. Uh, once it's ovulated, those cells that are left there are going to become what is called the corpus luteum, which are going to turn out a bunch of progesterone that is responsible for kind of the second half of that ovarian cycle taking place. Again, the physiology that we're just kind of touching on but not going too deep into. But you can see the different stages here, what's going on. Again, it's initially FSH and LH that trigger the development of these. We're going to see that these kind of build up and then they spike, which leads to that ovulation and the finishing of meiosis one of that oocyte. You can see early on, estrogen is the really high uh, hormone here. After ovulation, progesterone being made by this corporal zoodium becomes a lot higher. We're going to see estrogen go back up again, but it's not going to as high levels as it was in the initial first half of that ovarian cycle. Uh, and again, this is also going to be influencing that uterus, which we will take a look at the endometrial lining and what's going on with that in a later show here. At about 28 day, at about halfway of that 28 day period, about day 14, it's that increasing estrogen levels lead to a big surge of LH being dumped out. And this is going to cause a number of things to happen. It, it actually causes 
increase fluid into there and some collagenases actually weaken the wall of that ovarian follicle and it will kind of burst and it then is gonna be taken up by those fallopian tubes and the oocyte with the surrounding corona radiata is gonna get moved from the uterus, excuse me, moved from the ovary through the fallopian tubes down to the uterus. And this you can actually see happening right here, that burst and that fluid traveling out of it. And again, it's this feedback between FSH and LH. Normally at the beginning of this, you're going to have the pituitary gland under control of the hypothalamus, secrete FSH and LH, which leads to the development of these follicles. It actually inhibits the release of any FSH and LH until estrogen reaches a particular threshold, which causes a spike of LH, which leads to ovulation and the completion of meiosis one of that egg cell. What is left there is going to be maintained by this LH, which is those cells, those granulosa cells that are left there, they become what is called the corpus luteum, which corpus means body, luteum means yellow, so it's the yellow body. Uh, this is an endocrine organ temporarily that is going to release a lot of progesterone, which is going to help cause the over, not the ovary, but it's going to help cause the uterus to prepare for a possible pregnancy as well as inhibit the pituitary from sending any more signals to develop any more follicles. So you can see here this LH acts on the corpus luteum, tells it to release mainly progesterone and some estrogens, which block any more release of hormones from the pituitary gland until that monthly cycle is over, we'll see. So the corpus luteum has these thacal cells and then the inner granulosal cells surrounding it. Uh, always forms after ovulation. If an embryo does not develop, it'll last about 14 days. And at that point, the levels of LH get low enough that it degenerates and becomes scar tissue, uh, something called the corpus albicans. Uh, after, if a pregnancy was to occur, you actually have the embryo releasing a hormone called HCG, which mimics uh, LH and is gonna maintain that corpus luteum. Uh, after about the first trimester, the placenta takes over production of these hormones and that will slowly degenerate to a corpus albicans in, through late pregnancy. So this is that corpus albicans, that scar tissue that's left. You can see this is an atriatic follicle, one that degenerated where the granulosa cells kind of degenerate and fall apart. Uh, sooner they will become that corpus albicans. Uh, the other thing to kind of take a look at here is the uterus. So uterus is this structure right here. The fundus is the dome top region of this one. You got the main body of it, and then the cervix is the opening to the rest of the reproductive tract. Uh, this is lined with uh, epithelium that is going to be simple columnar in nature. Uh, we're going to see that there's a couple different layers to this endometrium as well as underneath that you have a smooth muscle layer called the myometrium which is going to be smooth muscle which is responsible for the relief, uh, the contractions during pregnancy and expelling the fetus during pregnancy piper go go on go later so you can see here is the endometrium. You have this basal layer that's down here. This is always maintained. So the stratum basalis or basalis glands, uh, these are what is left here that's gonna regenerate everything after menstruation. The stratum functionalis or the fun functionalis glands, this is that upper layer that is gonna be sloughed off during menstruation if a pregnancy doesn't occur. The myometrium is that smooth muscle that makes up the uterine wall which responds to oxytocin during uh, childbirth. And you, if you look at these hormone levels, you can see the estrogen early on here starts developing that glandular nature and makes it a little bit more vascular. And you can see it's really in the second half, that luteal phase of this where progesterone is at high levels. You can see that the endometrial lining gets much, much thicker, much more vascular in preparation for a possible pregnancy. If nothing occurs, you can see those hormone levels drop, which leads to this uh, layer of the uterus not being able to be maintained and you will slough off that stratum functionalis layer and we will reconstitute the gland from there in the next monthly cycle. 
And you can see again what's going on in the ovary now comparing it to this instead of the hormones. You can see what's going on in the different ovarian follicle relative to what's going on in the, in the uterus, in the uterine lining. So if you look at this, you can usually pick out the smooth muscle underneath. You're going to see these glands. They are kind of open to the surface, but again, based on the slicing, you don't always see that. Uh, these gland, these invaginations are not doing a lot of any type of secretion or anything. They're just, again, making a nice place for this to be able to attach in if a pregnancy were to occur. You can see the secretory phase here. The glands are much more involved, much more twisty turny. And now we're being filled with much more secretory products here in that luteal phase. If the corpus luteum is not maintained because the pregnancy doesn't occur, you get a loss of estrogen and progesterone. Uh, this causes constriction of these arteries, which leads to loss of blood flow to those upper layers here. And these are going to actually cause that endometrial lining to die off. It is then necrotic and shed out of there. The bottom layer remains viable. We keep blood flow to that, and it is used to regenerate the rest of the endometrial lining on the next cycle under the influence, again, of estrogen and progesterone. So and this kind of shows you now uh, what's going on with the lining, what's going on with the ovary, and what's going on with different ovarian hormones. We've kind of hit on all this, but this is the summary kind of showing you during the first few days of the cycle here, pituitary has started some development with the FSH, but you're really shedding off in the endometrium, the lining from the last month here. FSH then really gets pumped out here. It's gonna cause those ovarian follicles to develop and a lot of estrogen to be released, which makes the endometrial lining start to build back up again. In the second half here, we get a peak of LH stimulated by all that estrogen, causes ovulation which causes the corpus luteum to form, which is going to kick out a lot of estrogen and progesterone, which is going to get the, that glandular epithelium to develop much, much more. So what we'll do is we'll take a look at the ovary and the follicle types and a little bit at the endometrial lining and the two different layers to that and the myometrium. From there, we will then look at the male reproductive system and finish it off. We're looking at an ovary. Uh, this is on the Zoomify histology. The ones on the U of M uh, site are the ones I usually use, but they weren't looking quite as good on this one. Uh, so this one you can overall see the ovary here. Uh, I'd like to point out like here, here, and here some uh, O sites. So what I want to do is zoom in a little bit on the center here and point out a few things a little too far. So if we're looking at one of these here, uh, Primary follicle would probably be something like this one right here. Uh, maybe in bordering on a secondary follicle. You can see this one is a very late uh, primary follicle, almost bordering on a secondary follicle. You can see the antrum is just starting to form here. This would be a very early secondary follicle here. Uh, as we look around over to here, this would be a much later almost a graphian stage where now you can see here's that corona radiata there's the oocyte uh, the cumulus oophorus would be this area right here uh, if we go over in the other direction here i know there was another one over in the corner here that was a very i'm gonna zoom out just a second here you can see right here so this would be another example of one that is getting closer to ovulation so you can see large antrum surrounding this this would be all those granulosa cells you can see the thacal cell layer right here here is the oocyte that we're only seeing a part of but you can see that cumulus oophorus underneath it right here the corona radiata surrounding it uh, gives you a good example of what these actually look like I'm just going to try to see if we can see a very clean primary, which I'm not seeing one too much of anywhere around here, one that's just a straight uh, primary one. So then if we move on and look at some other stuff here, 
Uh, I really quickly wanted to go over to one of the U of M ones. So this one, it's zoomed out almost as far as I can get it. But if you're looking at this big structure that's taking up the whole field of view, and if you look over on the right here where the box is, that is a corpus luteum that is almost done. It's uh, pretty much a corpus luteum that's almost finished. You can see all those grain remnants of granulosa cells and the thacal cells kind of surrounding and going into it. That is a corpus luteum. If we look at some of these other ones here, uh, this would be a uterus. So you can see the myometrium right here. Endometrium is from about here out. This is right after menstruation. So this is only the stratum basalis. If we look at the other one here, we can see here's that myometrium again. You can see here's the stratum basalis in this region right here. You can see the stratum functionalis, which is much thicker on that one that is a later in the secretory phase. 